Welcome back, everyone. We're so happy to have you back. We're, uh, the beautiful summer weather has continued right into the month of October, so that's fabulous. I'm going to start our meeting off with our welcome and land acknowledgement. Uh, the town of Coburg respectfully acknowledges that we are located in the traditional and treaty territory of the Michisiga and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Trees First Nations which includes Curb Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog, Grandma, Bosali, and Georgina Island First Nations. The town of Coburg respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty's First Nations have been stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters, and that today remain vigilant over their health and integrity for generations to come. We are all treaty people. Okay, so... First thing that I want to say is I want to introduce Sarah Ingalls. Smile and wave, Sarah. And Sarah is our new web administrator um, with assistance from her brother as well. And I want to offer our gratitude to Don McLeod. Don supported our website development since 2018, um, added a lot of features, and made some really exceptional upgrades. Um, so we're most thankful to Don, and now we're really thankful to Sarah for accepting this new role for us. Um, now, 2024, just around the corner, and we're going to have a new slate of officers that will be put forward to our membership and voted on at our annual general meeting in February. So for the next three months, our nominations committee will be searching you out. Looking for volunteers. Um, our Willow Beach Field Naturalist Board, of course, is the heart of our organization. Um, we're ensuring that these meetings happen, that our outings happen, our newsletter, our education, our governance, everything comes together, right, to support this great club and brings us all together as nature lovers. So if you would like to join the board or if you would like to assist the nominations committee, Please talk to me or Marina, who's at the back. Um, we'd love to hear from you, and we'd love to have you on our board, for sure. Um, and membership. So I feel like we're always talking about our membership. So today is the first day that Chris is accepting membership renewals for 2024 as well. Um, so if you're one of those people that are really right on to it and looking forward to the future, speak to Chris at the back of the room as well. What's that? No. <laughs> All right. Okay, next we have our outings and our sightings. You wanna start with Richard? Richard, do you wanna go first? Thank you for being me let me unfold my notes because there's so many of them. Um, so uh, coming up, uh, well, nice to see everybody. Uh, this is September, isn't it? Wow, it's going by quickly too. Uh, but uh, yeah, on Sunday, we have a, uh, an urban tree walk and uh, that's going to happen uh, based uh, from my home on Henry Street. And so we'll meet there and uh, we'll... Uh, um, traverse the, uh, the uh, streets uh, in my neighborhood and check out uh, the trees. Actually, there are quite a number of very interesting trees. And I've spent some time cataloging them and uh, it should be, should be lots of fun. Actually, there's the odd tree I have not been able to identify. So uh, we had hoped that uh, Ed Cork, uh, the town arborist was going to be able to do this walk. But uh, the last week he was, uh, informed me that he wasn't going to be able to do it. So, so I'm doing it at this point. So uh, you'll have to bear with me. Um, coming up uh, mid-month, uh, the weekend, the 14th, 15th, uh, we're playing an astronomy outing uh, on Boardwalk, uh, the end of Bagot Street, uh, led by Brian Cook. Where are you, Brian? Raise your hand. There you go. And of course, this is dependent on having a cloudless sky. <laughs> <laughs> So it could be it could be either the Saturday or the Sunday evening. 
Um, and uh, through the month of October, watch for on the fly outing for raptors. We need uh, proper wind conditions and uh, uh, weather conditions uh, for the migratory birds to be coming through. Otherwise, they're scattered far and wide, and that's, you don't get a, um, a good sighting from one particular spot. Uh, in November, uh, we're looking for uh, a waterfowl outing, and uh, the uh, that one's, once again is somewhat dependent on migration patterns, and so watch for a date coming up for that. Uh, in December, uh, if you're interested in, in helping out with the bird counts, uh, there will be the Wesleyville bird count. I don't have a date for that uh, written down. Uh, December the 16th, there will be the Port Hope Coburg bird count. Um, December 17th is the Presque Isle bird count. And uh, on January the 1st is the Rice Lake bird count. So if you're interested in any of those events, um, uh, let me know, let Roger know, uh, let Elizabeth know, or any one of the members uh, uh, on the executive. And for Sunday's outing, if you are interested in, in attending, please register so that I know how many people are coming, uh, make arrangements for them. Um, refreshments when we finish. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And now, Marina. Everyone, Elizabeth couldn't be here tonight to do the sighting, so she asked me to cover what's been happening lately. So, as you can see from the slides, we've just got a few species, but there's birds everywhere. Um, bald eagles have been all over the county, many sightings everywhere. I saw three yesterday. Um, there have been, Chris saw eight over her house in the east end of Coburg. Um, there's tons by the Ganaraska River because of the salmon all over the place. So keep your eyes open. You might see bald eagles soaring overhead. Up here, we have two pictures. One is an adult bald eagle with the white head and the white tail. And on the right, your right, um, is a juvenile bald eagle. It takes a few years for them to, to get to the point where they have the white head. So, so you can see different kinds of birds in the sky, but they're still bald eagles. Um, next, we had an interesting sighting of Lincoln Sparrow. Um, this was Bill, uh, Bill Cassells, who's a new member, um, and he spotted the bird in the Lakeshore Dickinson area. So that's a bit west of Port Hope. Um, there's some country roads around there, farm fields and stuff, and that's where the Lincoln Sparrows are. Um, Chris and I were actually out there on yesterday and we found a couple of Lincoln Sparrows as well. So they're there if you're interested in finding sparrows. And then in um, the next bird is an orchard oriole, which was sighted in Diane and David's yard. Um, well, I don't know if they're still around. You just saw it that one day, right, David? No, just the one day. Just the one day. Um, but they're passing through, so you never know what you're going to see up there. So it's a beautiful, beautiful bird. Very similar to the Baltimore Oriole, but with a much more rusty color to its body. Otherwise, um, you may notice there's a lot of activity in your trees, a lot of little chirping and chirping and, and just uh, constant noise, but you don't see anything because it's just these little tiny birds doing their thing this time of year. So coming down from the north, we have a lot of little species arriving. So the first one that you'll start to see is the dark-eyed junco, which is the, this picture right here. So a little grayish black bird with a white belly. Um, they flit around on the ground a lot, and you can usually tell it's them because when they fly up, their tail flashes white. Um, the next one that is a recent arrival is the uh, white-throated sparrow. These are starting to be here in high numbers. Um, again, they're sculptors. You'll see them out on the ground a lot, and they have this really nice white, white throat. And then finally, we have the kinglets that pop up in the trees a lot. So that's a ruby crown kinglet. You can, he's demonstrating his ruby crown for you. You don't often see it when they're flitting around in the trees. And then the golden crown kinglet, this one, you can just catch a little bit of the yellow on its crown. So they're, they're little birds. I mean, they're, they're this big. So they're hard to spot, but they're out there in high numbers right now. It's hard to go out and look at a tree without finding them. So those are some of the birds that are out there, but I'm interested to hear what you all 
on Zoom and in the room here are seeing. So Sarah, if anybody puts their hand up on Zoom, let me know. But is there anybody here that's got sightings they'd like to report? Richard? Uh, last week, what we ended up doing down across the hard hill on the Yellow Lakes, the Mill Cross, the Mill Park, or the Camelot, there were and there were three. Okay. So Richard Gerard is reporting that there were uh, at the Campbellcroft Mill Pond there was um, a couple of trumpeter swans and the Denver dancers, as well as at Garden Hill Pond greater were there lesser yellow legs as well, yes. both greater and lesser yellow legs. So there's some good birds to be found. Brian, you had your hand up. Yes. Um, <coughs> earlier in the week, I was. Uh, Yeah. Thank you for that. So Brian Cook is reporting he had a Merlin murder in the backyard. Merlin took a small bird. He witnessed a crime. Um, Merlin caught a small bird and Brian was able to watch the bird be come dinner. You have one? Um, so from Matt um, on Zoom, um, there was two bottle links at the Woodland Trailhead um, of Northumberland County Forest. Okay. Two bottle links at the trailhead of the Northumberland Woodland Trailhead, Northumberland County Forest. So that's that's a great sighting for that location. Is it not? Yep. Um, so Anne Tesla said Swanson thrushes off and on all week eating aerial aerial berries. Swanson's thrushes. Very nice. That's a okay. report of a lynx. What do you want for lynx? Charlie's on the Zoom. Charlie is on the Zoom right now. Yeah. Wow, a link sighting. That's a uh, link sighting in Warhorse. That's interesting. I'd love to see the picture. Yeah. <laughs> Any other reports, Don? Kristen Osborne at Merskeel didn't provide me with numbers, but reports on Gull Island yesterday, American Golden Plovers and Hudsonian Godwits. Wow, American Golden Plovers and Hudsonian Godwits on Gull Island at Preskill. Very nice. Sarah? Um, Michael Piltz said uh, we had 20 bluebirds at the Yuli nest box in the Piltz backyard. Wow, 20 bluebirds in their, <laughs> near their nest boxes in their backyards. That's beautiful. Great. Anyone else? Jonko's are back. Jonko's are back, yes. Yeah, they're starting to Twitter all over the place. Oh, great. That's um, all we have to report for tonight, but keep your eyes open and keep the reports coming in to Elizabeth so she'll compile them for the next meeting. But there's, there's still some interesting birds around. You just have to, you have to, Work for it a little bit this time of year. Right, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Marina. And your photos are spectacular, and they're a really nice addition to the um, to the sightings. So thank you so much for those. Um, okay, so it's my pleasure now to introduce Laura. 
Um, Laura uh, Timms has, has studied at the University of Guelph, the University of Toronto, and at McGill University. She's an ecologist at Credit Valley Conservation in Mississauga. She analyzes and monitoring and inventory data for different species groups to develop tools and strategies for biodiversity conservation and management. Laura is an adjunct professor in forestry at the University of Toronto and is currently the president of the Entomological Society of Ontario. Tonight, Laura is going to speak about the cultural history, ecology, diversity, and conservation of lady beetles in our area. Take it away, Laura. Hi. Okay. Just going to share my screen. Okay. All right, we're all good. Okay, um, thank you so much for having me. Um, this is a new club for me to speak to. So um, as mentioned, I work for Credit Valley Conservation in the Mississauga area, and I'm used to speaking to naturalist clubs in that watershed, but I have never been out to speak to you guys before. So thank you very much for inviting me and having me, I appreciate it. And um, just to tell you a little bit about me other than what was in the introduction. So. I'll tell you about my presentation first. So I'm going to go through a little bit about me. I'm going to talk about lady beetles. So what they are, their biology, some of the species that you can see in this area, other than the introduced ones, which are probably the ones you're most familiar with. Um, talk about some of the conservation concerns with lady beetles and insects more generally. And then after that sort of negative focus, we'll go back and bring it into things you can actually do to make a difference. And that's where we'll end. So about me, I've been working with Credit Valley Conservation for 10 years now, since 2013. Um, and although I'm not an entomologist in my job, I am an ecologist that I primarily work with data on birds and plants and fish. Um, I am an entomologist at heart and by training. And um, I, I really got into insects while at the University of Guelph. I went there thinking I was gonna become a vet and I left um, just really into insects and entomology. Um, because I realized while well, there that there are so many things that we don't know about insects, that there's still, it's this giant area of things left to discover. Um, and there are so many of them in the world and I just got really excited about that. Um, so although my job is not primarily focused on insects or entomology, I have found a way to work it in the last few years. And we just wrapped up the fifth year of our citizen science project called the Butterfly Blitz that we've been running. It's this summer long project where people can collect observations of butterflies in the Credit River watershed. And over the past five years, we've collected 9,000 observations of 77 species of butterflies. And prior to that, we had actually a surprisingly little amount of data on, water, of, on butterflies in the watershed, even though butterflies are like the best known, most loved insect group. We hadn't ever done surveys for them before in our area. And now we have five years of amazing data and we're gonna use it for all kinds of purposes. So um, like my daughter says, I love bugs. Um, and so I'm, I'm really happy to be able to have a chance to speak about them. Um, this guy actually is one of the reasons that I started to love bugs as well. So this is Edward Wilson. If you know of an entomologist, this is probably the one you know of. Um, and he wrote, lots of books, but the one that kind of hooked me when I was at Guelph was called The Ants. Um, he wrote it with a colleague, uh, Bert Holdudler. And um, it, he studied ants and he discovered and shared all sorts of fascinating things about them. You know, ants are farmers, ants have wars with each other, ants do all kinds of amazing things. Um, he also was a big advocate for insects and insect conservation and conservation in general. And he, he said this thing about insects, um, which I won't read the whole thing, but he called insects the little things that run the world. And they truly are. And I have a whole talk that I give often about insects and their importance in our ecosystems, and then talking about insect decline and conservation. Um, then I'll touch on a little bit more of this at the end. But um, just to remember, you know, although we all love our birds and our plants and our bit of things, insects are the little things that really run the world. Um, and to emphasize this, this is a species scape. Um, where every organism in this picture, its size reflects how many of them there are in the world. So most living things are in fact insects when you think about how many of them there are. And you find the mammal. <laughs> it's, 
Uh, yeah, it's that tiny little uh, moose or, or elk, whatever that is there. Um, so, you know, hopefully that sort of adds some perspective to your own sense of significance when you think about your place in this species of the world. Lots of spiders and other invertebrates as well. But yeah, most living things really are insects. Okay, so getting into detail on lady beetles in particular. So lady beetles um, are a family of beetles called the coccinellids. And um, I wasn't ever particularly into lady beetles prior to about six years ago, but I realized through my work at CBC that if you want to engage with people who aren't entomologists about insects, butterflies are a really great group to work with, but also lady beetles are a great group because everyone is kind of familiar with lady beetles and they're not actually that hard to identify, well, most of them, um, once you learn a few things about them. So lady beetles are beetles. They have, like all beetles, that hard, those hard outer wings. Um, lady beetles are sort of all rounded and dome-shaped with those hard wings, like all beetles. They're often, but not always, red. So I've got one example here of the 14, well, the thing's getting cut off at the bottom with the zoom. There's a, is there a way to make that bar disappear? Realizing I can see it, but you guys can't. Anyways, that yellow one at the bottom is the 14 spotted lady beetle. Um, and so it's one of our not red lady beetles. You might see that and think it was a different kind of beetle. You'll also see some pictures through the presentation of others that look quite different as well. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, maybe we'll get there. Um, they also don't always have spots. So the one at the top there, the polished lady beetle has no spots at all. And there are some lady beetles that sometimes um, have, have forms without spots. So you might have seen a lady beetle without spots and not realized it's a lady beetle as well. Um, there are also some really, really small ones. There are one millimeter long lady beetles, tiny. I'll show some pictures of them. And there's also some bigger ones like that one in my title um, slide, the, the eye spotted lady beetle that are bigger, like 10 millimeters. So there's quite a diversity of, of sizes and colors and patterns. Um, so why are they called lady beetles? Now, I mean, no one absolutely knows, but there's some pretty good theories out there. And the idea is that their name refers to the Virgin Mary. And the story goes that um, when crops were plagued by aphids, people would pray to the Virgin Mary and ladybugs would come in and eat the aphids. And so they, they are our ladies beetles. And um, there are also some ideas that, that Mary is often seen in a red cloak, like lady beetles um, with spots. And in some languages, the name for lady beetles more directly translates to Mary. So in German, it's Marienkaffer, which are Mary's beetles. So this is the idea of where the name lady beetles comes from. Um, and Mary is you know, often seen sort of in situations like this in nature. Okay, lady beetles have uh, a life cycle that's uh, got complete metamorphosis. So like a lot of other insects, you know, they have four distinct stages. They have eggs, they have larvae, they have pupae, and they have adults. And each stage looks a little bit different. And um, you may not have realized that this is what ladybug larvae look like for the most part. I like to think of them as little alligators. So mm -hmm. They are fierce little predators, most of them running around and eating aphids and other small insects. Um, the adults are the easiest to identify. It's actually really hard to identify larval ladybugs. Some are easier than others, but if you're gonna try to identify a lady beetle, you really wanna be looking at an adult. I should say that almost all of the photos in this presentation are photos from my naturalist, and I have included the names of the photographers on, at the bottom of the slide. Um, lady beetles hibernate in the winter as adults. And, it, and when they're hibernating in natural places, this will be in places like under logs, under rocks, in bark cracks and crevices. Um, they often also aggregate. So you will find big groups of lady beetles hibernating together in the winter. And some species actually orient themselves and move towards large landscape features like hills or big trees or rocks, and then they'll group together near those big landscape features. And the first ones there um, release pheromones that then attract other ones to that same spot. Why do they uh, hibernate together? Well, 
touch on that in a second, but you might be familiar with large aggregations of lady beetles in your own house or in a shed or something like that. Um, in particular, they introduced Harmonia axiridis. Um, and that can really be a pest. And why they hibernate together, we think, is because there's better survival in groups because predators are more likely to be deterred by lots of brightly colored red and spotted or orangey and yellow beetles than just a single one. Um, of course, again, this, this is science. It's a theory. It's not necessarily 100% known. Um, lady beetles do have this aposomatic coloration. So they're, they've got red, orange, and yellow colors with these black dots. In nature, this is a signal that you don't want to touch them, right? That's often what we see throughout all kinds of animals. Um, so lady beetles are actually, can be a little bit toxic. Um, they all can bleed from their joints when threatened and they leak out that little stuff. Um, their blood is smelly and toxic. Maybe you've done this if you tried to clean up those big groups of lady beetles in your house in the winter. Um, and it can be a real problem. It can stain your drapes or your carpets or what have you. And it smells bad when they release that. Um, so don't try to eat. It's called reflexive bleeding. When they do that. Okay, just really basic adult lady beetle anatomy. We've got the three basic insect parts. We've got head, thorax, abdomen. You can't see the abdomen because it's hidden under the wings. Um, if you're trying to identify a lady beetle, the most important parts are usually on the back. So the patterns on the wings, but also right behind the head, that's called the pronotum. So you can see in the diagram there. And so if you're taking a photo or just looking at a lady beetle, um, seeing that part is usually really important. And also the, the elytra or those hard wings. For some species, you also need to see the underside. So if you're taking photos or trying to identify them again, you can also try to get a shot of the underside if you can. So I mentioned before, most lady beetles are predators. So they eat smaller soft bodied insects like aphids, mites, mealybugs, scale insects. Um, some ladybugs are actually, lady beetles are not predators and they feed on mildew. And some actually feed on plants, but none of the native species we have here in Canada do that. So there are none here that are plant pests. So that 20 spotted lady beetle there is feeding on some mildew on that leaf. And you can see that little alligator-like larva just chomping right there. And maybe you've observed that on your own milkweed plants, say in your yard or something like that. So they are predators and this is great. So people often ask me, should I buy bags of ladybugs that are occasionally sold at garden centers? And the answer is no, <laughs> for a few reasons. Um, they're great to have in your garden not when they arrive there naturally. But if you buy a bag of ladybugs like this and release them, they will just all disperse away from your yard. Um, they're not necessarily gonna be any more effective than the ones that are already there. Um, many will not survive. They may not be native species. So it's better to focus on making your own yard attractive for biodiversity, for ladybugs and other insect species that are gonna be predators. So I would never advise buying a bag of ladybugs or praying mantids or any other insect species that you can get sold as um, biocontrols that you can buy. I mean, well, yes, the, like those ones, anyways. Okay, um, a little bit about the culture. So ladybugs are considered to be good luck in lots of places. Um, and they're one of the first insects that kids learn about. So kids learn about the monarch butterfly and kids learn about ladybugs. And those are, if you're gonna know about an insect, talk about, that's what kids wanna talk about. Um, we've got nursery rhymes about them. Interestingly, that ladybug, ladybug, fly away home nursery rhyme is actually thought to come from the practice of burning hop vines to get rid of pests. And then all the ladybugs would fly away because their home was on fire. All right. Getting a little bit into the diversity, I think this was in the description of my talk. Um, people are often surprised to learn that there are 88 species of lady beetle in Ontario. Um, 81 of those are native and seven are introduced. And about half of those are really small and hard to identify. So unless you have a microscope. So these are four of those really small and hard to identify lady beetles. You would probably never know those were lady beetles. You might not even notice them. They're so small crawling around on the plants in your yard. So these ones are all between one and three millimeters long. Um, they are quite difficult to identify. 
if you don't have the specimen in a microscope and take some photos, but some of them you can take a shot and you can at least identify them to genus. There's a project on iNaturalist called the Cox and Ellids of Ontario, and um, I helped co-curate it, although I haven't been as active the past year or two because of the butterfly projects, but I do go in there and correct identifications and check out what's being seen. Um, I was surprised when I went in to look at it before this talk, actually, how many more observations there are now. There's 24,000, this is for all of Ontario, over 24,000 observations. That 60 species is wrong because a couple of them were incorrect. Um, but what I want to point out here is that um, two thirds of those observations are of introduced species. So the top two, the Asian lady beetle and the seven spotted lady beetle, those are both introduced. So is the 14 spotted and the variegated. So I, I think it's like almost half even are just that one species, the Asian lady beetle, Harmonia oxidus. So for most people, when you encounter a lady beetle, it's going to be an introduced species. But we have all kinds of beautiful native species. And so I want to introduce some of them to you now and tell you a little bit about them. This, I think, is my favorite native lady beetle species. It's the spotted lady beetle. And um, I really love its pattern. The pronotum, that's that area right behind the head in this picture, it's at the bottom. Those two spots on it are often kind of heart shaped. So it's really kind of cute when you look at it. Um, its color can be a little pinker than this too. Sometimes it's more reddish, it's more pinkish. It's one of the first lady beetles that comes out in the spring. So you'll often see it on those first spring flowers and it's a nice sign that spring is here. Um, another really cool thing about it is that it's frequently seen parasitized. So in this photo, you'll notice that this lady beetle is on a cocoon. You kind of see that? The paras so I don't know if I mentioned before, but I, in my um, academic studies, I studied parasitoid wasps. And so I find this super cool as well. So a parasitoid wasp has attacked this lady beetle and the parasitoid has eaten the lady beetle's insides out and then popped out a hole in its side and made a cocoon, but the lady beetle is left alive. And the lady beetle is now really interested in protecting that cocoon. So it will hang out by that cocoon and protect it and defend it, even though that parasitoid has basically eaten loaded most of its insides up. So um, it's a really, it's a really cool system uh, if you're into sort of gruesome parasitoids. Um, but also it's a really great way to spot these because they don't move far away from the, the parasitized cocoon, right? So when they're there, they're there and you can take a good look at them and take some good photos. So that's the spotted lady beetle. The eye spotted lady beetle is the one that was in the photo associated with this talk. And it's, it's maybe my second favorite. These two are my top two. It's pretty big. It's one of our two largest lady beetles. It's got this beautiful pattern where its spots are ringed with lighter spots. So it's the eye spotted beetle. Um, and it gets darker with age. So the older this lady beetle gets, the darker its wings get. And then those spots actually become much harder to see. They just sort of become faint rings under dark. Um, those darker wings. So that's kind of a neat thing too, because most insects don't really change their appearance much over time, but this, this one does. This is the polished lady beetle. I love the curly cues on this promotum. I think it's really beautiful kind of art deco almost. Um, it's our only true spotless red species. So sometimes the Asian lady beetle has no spots, um, but it's not that it's really spotless. It just it has incredibly variable wing patterns. But the polished lady beetle is truly spotless. It's very shiny, very polished, very rounded and dome shaped. Um, and I, I find it, it's not that common. So I get pretty excited when I see it. The streaked lady beetle is brownish. Um, something you might not think was a lady beetle. It is kind of streaked, like it's been painted with a brush that doesn't have a lot of paint on it. Um, and it will often come to moth traps or other nights at light, um, lights at night. So you don't necessarily see it very often in the day, but you might see it around porch lights or if anyone here sets up moth traps or anything like that, you might see it at your trap the next day when you're checking. The glacial lady beetle um, is pretty small. It's not one of those tiny one millimeter ones, but it's smaller than you. Every time I see it, I get surprised at how small it is how hard to take a good picture of it it is. It's got a very specific pattern of spots. There's another species that looks quite, um, quite similar to it, but the two spots aren't connected, but that sort of longer spot there has a break in the middle. 
Um, and interestingly, Southern Ontario seems to be a stronghold for this beetle. Um, there are a lot of records in this area, but in not many other places. There's the three-banded lady beetle, which is more common a little further north of here, and it actually seems to be declining. So we'll get into this in a bit, but a number of our native lady beetles um, are declining or have disappeared. And this is one of them that, that does seem to be the populations are going down. Um, but another one I think is just quite striking and beautiful with that pattern. So those were a few of our native species. Um, the ones I picked because I really like their patterns or they have some neat biology. If you were interested in going out to find lady beetles yourself, um, you can go out and look throughout the summer. There are still some around right now, of course, but especially early to midsummer is the best time to find a large diversity of them. Look in areas with lots of plants and flowers. Um, they're there looking for aphids and other things to eat. So you can look for, for aphids and other food sources like mildew. If you find a milkweed plant, for instance, that has tons of those little orange aphids on them, that's a good place to look for lady beetles. Um, you could use a sweep nut. You could use a black light for those ones that come to lights. Or I put this picture in because I always think this is such a great low tech method to look for insects. You could just use an umbrella and a stick. Um, so you can just hold an umbrella underneath some shrubs or some branches and just beat those branches with a stick and see what falls into the umbrella. And you'll find more than lady beetles. You'll find caterpillars and spiders and all kinds of fun things, but it's a very low tech, inexpensive, easy way to look for bugs. Okay. So I mentioned that we have lost or are losing some of our native lady beetles. And there are two species at risk in Ontario that are lady beetles, the nine spotted lady beetle and the transverse lady beetle. Um, that, that pinned nine spotted from 1977 was um, not the last, but it was one of the, the time when the lady beetle was more common <laughs> um, and you just can't find it. Now it hasn't been seen in quite a while. And the thought is it's competition from all these introduced species, like the Asian lady beetle and the seven spotted, as I mentioned, in combination with other factors. So pathogens that have been introduced as well, frequent use of pesticides. There are several other species on the watch list that may get added to the species at risk list um, as further studies are done and it's established whether the populations have actually declined enough. There's a really neat website and project called the Lost Ladybug Project. It's based in New York State, but a lot of the same information applies here. So if you're interested in finding out more about species that have been lost and how you can help, that would be a great place to check out if you just looked up the Lost Ladybug Project. So that leads me into talking about insect decline in general. So you may have heard that insect populations appear to be declining globally. There have been a bunch of studies showing this. Um, one of the sort of problems with really documenting that very well is we don't have a lot of data, especially here in Canada. We don't have long-term data the way we have long-term data on birds. We don't have that data for insects to say, yes, we have the data to show you for sure insects have declined. Um, we have lots of anecdotes, people talking about windshields, you know, I don't see as many bugs in my windshield as I used to, the feeling that yes, there are fewer around, but it's very hard to show that with data and science. There are lots of reasons why insect populations are declining. There isn't one clear smoking gun that applies to everything, but the big things that are affecting all of biodiversity are really the things affecting insects as well. So that would be habitat loss, invasive species, um, climate change we'll throw in there. Some specific ones um, for insects would be light pollution and pesticides. Light pollution is actually a really big problem for lots of insect groups um, because it disrupts their behaviors at nights and things like that. And then pesticides obviously are purposely to kill insects. Um, going back to Edward Wilson, so he called insects the little things that run the world. He also has this quote about what would happen if insects left. So he says, if all mankind were to disappear, the world would be fine, basically. But if insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos um, because they are the things that run the world and without them, the world would really be in, be in trouble. So this is where I turn to um, talking about what you can do. And this would be part of the talk I normally give about insect decline and, and conservation. So. Um, 
I briefly touched on lady beetles. Um, there's all kinds of other wonderful insect groups out there. I always like to say, if you are interested in insects in nature, of which I assume you all are, um, then the best, one of the best things you can do is just be an ambassador and tell other people about insects and why they're neat and why you might want to be interested in them instead of just swatting them away or killing them. This comes up a lot in like, say, neighborhood Facebook groups as well. <laughs> and the power of, of some positive posting there can be helpful. Um, I, when I started at Credit Valley Conservation, we didn't have anyone focusing on insects because it's not part of our mandate, but I started a campaign where I, I wrote a newsletter for our internal newsletter that we have. I write an article every month or so called Know Your Insects. And um, I did that so that I could bring a little entomology into my work, but it has actually caused this whole avalanche of interest at CBC in insects. And now people are always talking about insects. We're writing, we're sharing more stuff with our, um, our members of the public about insects. We're doing work related to insects with community science. And so just this little bit of sharing knowledge and enthusiasm can really have an avalanche of, of an impact. I always say this. Um, in addition to letting your friends and family and members of the public know you care about insects and nature, you can let your political representatives know. Um, if you don't know about the Environmental Registry of Ontario, it's a place you can go and comment on proposed changes to policy. Um, you may talk about that here in your group, I'm not sure, but if you are, you know, have the chance, speak to your political representatives at every level, you know, you're in your town as well, about your concern for biodiversity. Let them know it's important to you. Um, you can landscape with native plants and use wildlife friendly yard maintenance methods. So especially right now, leave the leaves. You may be cleaning up your gardens right now or about to, or maybe you just have, but don't clean up your leaf litter. <laughs> you may have heard this message before. There's lots of insects, including ladybugs, that overwinter in leaf litter. And when you clean it all up and send it away in your compost bags, then you're sending away those bugs and they're not gonna stay in your yard. Um, so in addition to lady beetles that I pointed out that overwinter and late later, um, you know, the fertility butterflies, like the great spangled fertility and other butterflies like that, they overwinter in leaf litter. So their caterpillars eat violets and they eat the leaves of violets and then they develop about halfway and then they go down into the leaf litter and overwinter and then the, the next following spring they start to emerge and grow again. So if you clean away the leaf litter, you have some violets in your yard, then you're throwing away those half-developed fertility butterflies and they're not gonna be around next year. Um, the hummingbird clearing moths also overwinter in leaf litter. I've seen those, they're beautiful and amazing. So um, leave your leaves and also um, use native plants. I could go on a tangent about monarchs as well and, and Dawn could share some information, but um, there's lots of evidence that says even just having a few milkweeds in your yard can be very helpful to monarchs. In fact, small little patches of milkweed are better for monarchs than giant patches of milkweed. So um, plant a few milkweeds in your yard if you haven't already. Avoid pesticide use in your yard. Um, advocate for no or reduced pesticide, pesticide work use at work or elsewhere. And if you must use them, make sure you're using them the right way. So don't just spray your plants without even having the need for it. You know make sure that there's a need for it. Um, this one I always throw in there because uh, climate change is a problem, obviously. And so I always like to encourage people to research your carbon footprint and reduce it when you can. And there's lots of ways you can look that up, looking at footprint calculators and whatnot. Um, and I, I, this is a funny one because I know you guys are members of Ontario Nature through this club, but um, I think one of the best things you can do to support nature, insects, ladybugs, anything, is to support conservation organizations that work to protect habitat because habitat loss is one of the huge problems, right? So um, you've got the nature of these just suggestions. Um, no, none of these organizations pay me <laughs> to say this, but you've got Ganarathka Conservation, obviously, is one, the Northumberland Land Trust, Ontario Nature, Ontario Heritage Stretch Nature Conservancy. You could support these with your time as a volunteer, with money, with donations of land. This is one of the best things you can do to support biodiversity. 
And I like to end with this, you can become a citizen scientist. So I'm hoping some people in this room already use iNaturalist. Um, if not, you could try taking it up and get totally hooked on it like I did. Um, but there's lots of great use for data on iNaturalist. And so if you take pictures of ladybugs and add them to iNaturalist, I will see them. If you take pictures of, because it's Ontario and I look at all the Ontario ladybugs, but um, take pictures of anything and add it. And someone else may have a use for it in some scientific project. Um, I took a quick look in Northumberland County and I just looked in South Northumberland. I didn't count Peterborough because all the m &R folks are up there and they have tons of observations. Um, but there's only 58 lady beetle observations from South Northumberland. So this is a map of the lady beetle observations. Only nine species. You can bet they're all the introduced ones um, with a couple of the other natives in there as well. And look at how scattered those observations are. So I would love to see a lot more dots on that map of lady beetles added and more species, because I know they're there. In fact, some of those observations are mine from my in-laws house in Port Hope. So <laughs> I can count those. Um, one of the, the best things that came out of that Butterfly Blitz project I mentioned is, is when we started the Butterfly Blitz, our map looked like this as well. And at the end of five years, we painted it orange with dots. And so that's through the effort of people just going out and having your phone with you and taking a picture of what you see and adding it. And even if you don't know what it is, it doesn't matter. Someone will help you identify it and you can learn as you go. So that's the end of my talk and I would be really happy to take questions. Yes. Well, there's always a standard ladybug before the age of months came Uh-huh. Was that one of the ones that you mentioned? Which one was it? It's yeah, let's go back to oh, this nine one. Spotted. So nine spotted was the common one. And now yeah, people, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it looks pretty similar to the seven spotted. So that's that number two spot one there, which is introduced. Um, but so it's the, cause it's the same genus, but yeah, it is a different species. So yeah, and it's totally, totally gone. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't repeat the question. The question was, you may have inferred from the um, answer, what was the lady beetle that was really common that everyone knew was the standard ladybug, that it was the nine spotted. Yep. Sorry, go ahead. Right. So the question is, there's the Asian lady beetle, and then there's the Japanese beetle, and what's the difference? So the Japanese beetle is not a lady beetle. Um, it's that thing that munches up like almost every plant. It's very shiny. Uh, it's like metallic almost. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's a different family. They're kind of beautiful when you look at them as well. I mean, I think all bugs are beautiful, but they are definitely a pain. Yeah, not a ladybug. These guys don't eat your plants. They will eat your aphids, which you might consider to be beneficial. But yeah, but they're out competing our so they they Yeah, yeah. Oh. The Asian lady bill just eats aphids and stuff. Japanese people eat plants. Yes. So I guess I'm an ambassador of ladybugs because I have told my neighbor who would live out in the country and she would kill them because they get into her house. And when I've been in her house, I rescue them, uh, which I do at our place. I sometimes have taken as many as 50 out of one window. But my question is, because why would they come to see, like you said, late spring, early summer? They're somehow getting into the house, staying in that window, and a lot of them die off before I get to them. So every day I, I have my bug cup and I'm putting them back outside. But why do they come in and they die off? Right. You know I mean? Yes. So the I'll, I'll briefly say that you are an insect ambassador because you told your neighbor not to kill bugs and you take them out of her house, which is lovely. Um, but why do they come in the house in such large numbers in the spring um, when they just die off in the windowsill? So the short somewhat flippant answer is they're not smart. <laughs> um, they're coming in, I mean, they're looking for those natural places to hibernate and, and stay and be warm, right? And they happen to find their way into your house. And a windowsill is a very nice warm spot because it's got the sun probably. And so they're hanging out there because it's warm, but it's also not a natural place to aggregate and hibernate and it's dry. 
and there's no because it's a house and it's climate controlled and so there's no moisture going on and so that's not a particularly good space for them to stay in and if i find them in late winter how cold is too cold putting them outside like i mean i can put them out anyway but would they survive well, so they may not survive if it's a dramatic switch from being indoors to just being out in minus 20. So how cold is too cold to put them outside was the question. Um, yeah, so if it's a very dramatic temperature change and you just put them out, say, onto the ground or onto the snow, that may not be particularly good for them. You could try to lessen the impact by putting them under a log or under some leaf litter or something like that, where it's a little more insulated. Um, if it's if it's the Asian lady bill, I might not be too concerned about keeping them alive. <laughs> it would be my other answer. Don't feel too guilty about it if some of them die. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'll go at the back. Yeah. Uh, what specifically were the ones that were brought in? What were they brought in to combat? Why were they introduced? Well, they were introduced as pest control. So what, what specifically were the ones introduced and why were they introduced? Yes, they were introduced for pest control. Yes. What, what pests? Oh, aphids. Yeah, the pests, they were introduced for aphids, mealybugs. Yeah, those plant pests and things that would damage crops, right? Yeah. And they will, so, you know, soybean aphid has been a, occasionally a big problem for soybean crops. And you will see really big populations of Asian lady beetles build up um, occasionally when soybean aphid crops build up. And there was, um, I think it was a baseball game that was disrupted with like a really big swarm of them maybe 20 years ago. But that was in the news. I saw another, yeah, yes. Uh, are different species associated with different Plants, they favor looking for plants to hunt. They've got plant organizations that size and training. If you were looking for more obscure species, you'd be looking for a particular population of plants. Right. So the question is are certain lady beetle species more likely to be found on certain species of plants because they're looking for prey that are more likely to be found on those plants? Gosh, I wish I knew the answer to that question. I, I don't think so. So nothing I have read has ever indicated that, but I will say lady beetle ecology is not that well known, surprisingly. So um, when you read about lady beetles, you will find a lot of stuff on identification of lady beetles, but there's not a lot of stuff on lady beetle ecology. So I have never read anything that indicates you're more likely to find this species in this kind of thing. But um, I think if you spent some quality time observing, you may begin to notice those differences as well. So one thing I've noticed just from looking at pictures on iNaturalist is that um, that that spotted lady beetle, the one I said comes out in the spring, uh, seems to really like dandelions. So they'll eat pollen too. The adults will eat pollen, and you see them on dandelions a lot. Um, so I think they certainly, I mean, certainly they will have preferences, but. You can't open a field guide like you can for butterfly, and it'll direct you to look in this particular habitat type for this kind of lady beetle. Maybe in maybe in 20, 30 years we'll have that. That would be wonderful. Yes. Uh, regards to pesticides, what's the latest uh, state of science in regulations on probably this neonic? It gets annoyance, I guess, uh, in Ontario. So the question is, what's the latest state of the science and regulation for a new noise in Ontario? And I have to admit, I don't know the complete answer on that question. It is still under debate. I know they were approved for use for a bunch of things, and then they were all then that sort of was drawn back a little bit. Um, I think you can still use them in certain situations, um, but um, no, like. Um, agricultural operations, but not for home use or anything like that. So, but I haven't looked in the last year or so, so there could be changes that I'm not aware of. Yes, so the back. It's like to an Right, so how does light pollution affect lady beetles is the question. 
So there are some lady beetles that are flying around at night, like those ones, excuse me, the ones I mentioned that you're more likely to find at moth traps, say. And so those ones would be affected by lights because they would be drawn to those lights and then they would stay there instead of doing what they're supposed to do, which is flying around and looking for food and mating and all that. Yeah, it's less obvious than for moths or for fireflies or for other species, but there are lady beetles that are flying around at night. So. Oh, yes, sorry. Why am I looking? Oh, you have one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're pointing so that. Yes. Um, so I might have missed this when you were doing the life cycle. But so they hibernate over winter. Like, what is their, how long do they live? Like, are they laying eggs and in the spring and dying in the spring or or what? I, I think I missed. Yeah, I, I don't think I gave all the seasons, but it won't be the same for every species. But for a lot of lady beetles, the adults will overwinter. And then in the spring, they'll mate, lay eggs, the larvae will develop, and then there'll be a new generation of adults, but they'll have multiple generations in the summer. So again, different for different species, but the Asian lady beetle, I think, will have like four or five generations in the summer. Um, and you will often, you'll see always the eggs. You can see their eggs at those little orange eggs on the other side, um, and there will be larvae, and there'll be different stages around all at the same time. Yes. Uh, what do you think about bug zappers? I personally think they should be banned. Are they um, lady beetles affected by bug zappers? Sure. So the question is, are lady beetles affected by bug zappers? And yes, they certainly would be. And the ones that are around at night. Um, yeah, they, they kill a lot of insects. I mean, they're not incredibly widespread. They're not as widespread as street lights and things. So they are less of a widespread problem, but they certainly affect the insects where they are located for sure. <laughs> so the question is, do we know how long lady beetles have been on the planet? And I'm sure that there is an answer to that question and I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, but yes, if we if you pulled open the, um, the book on beetle evolution or, lady, or even on lady beetles themselves, it'll say something about their evolutionary history for sure. I wish I could have that number for you right off, but I don't. They've been, I mean, like most insects, they've been around for quite a long time. Wonderful. Thank you very much for everyone for your questions and your time. Thank you, Laura. I wish this was an umbrella because we're all going to be carrying our umbrellas around and searching for um, insects, but this is for you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> that was really, really interesting. And except for that one scary little piece that I'm going to try not to sleep and think about. Um, With the parasitoid? Yeah. That. <laughs> um, I'm sure we can. I can look at the three banded or the eye spotted. And, and I hope to see everyone out, out in the summer with the bright umbrellas um, looking for ladybugs. So thank you so much. Enjoy that. Okay, I'm going to see everyone again October the 27th, and we're going to be doing Owls of Canada. So that's really exciting. And there is the Owl Foundation. Um, there's some information on the back table as well. Um, where are you, Don? You were just there, right? Did you want to say anything? Like you, you enjoyed it, right? It was. It was a tremendous experience. Kenny McKeever spoke to this about the oh. 1970s. And I never had the opportunity to visit it. Fortunately, Willow Beach. Sorry, do you want to? <laughs> sure. The Willow Beach Club is a donor, so each year uh, an invitation is received for a couple of members or a couple to uh, go and visit the Owl Foundation. And uh, it was a tremendous experience. 20 acres of Buildings, uh, 
Only three paid staff, they rely entirely on donations. Uh, our member Audrey Wilson's been a donor for 50 years. Uh, and I'd encourage anyone to uh, go and visit this center in Vineland. Thank you. So we're all going to hear about Owls of Canada um, on October the 27th. And, and you can put that Owl Foundation into your calendar for, for maybe next year. I know they, they do targeted tours and they're very small groups um, that they take out. So, but something that I'm sure would be of interest. And uh, please join Richard on Sunday for the Urban Tree Walk and let him know ahead of time that you're coming. He would appreciate that. And don't forget, now we're renewing our memberships for 2024. And remember to nominate whoever's beside you to be on the board. <laughs> okay, good night.